Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Roundtable number three. My name is Chad Smelter. I am your host. Welcome, everyone, and uh, everyone that's joining us live and on LinkedIn. Please post comments. Please share your you know, commentaries with us. If we mess anything up or say something that you don't like, you can feel free to make a comment, and we'll address it. Uh, but first, we're going to start with introductions. We'll start with Nick, Nick Spano. Hey, Thanks, Nick, Nick Spano. Hey, equipment. hey, hi, everybody. Back again, number three, huh? Yeah, back again. Uh, Susan, uh, go ahead. Well, Nick, give us a little background with Essential Equipment, what you do. Uh, Essential Equipment uh, provide uh, uh, pipeline inspection, pipeline cleaning equipment and service. So, uh, you know, sales and repairs uh, for IBOC and GAPVAX uh, products. Yeah, for uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Well, thank you for joining us, Nick. Susan, you're up next. All right. My name is Suzanne Chin Taylor. I'm the CEO and president of Creative Raven and the Do It Group. We help companies in the wastewater industry, infrastructure industries, take the mystery out of digital marketing so they can use it effectively to gain business and create more opportunities. Thanks for joining us, Susan. Appreciate it. And if you have any issues with the voice, just let us know. We'll We'll help you out. Uh, Eric, go I'll ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Susan. What'd you say? I'll just mute. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Eric, you're up next. Yeah, I'm Eric Dupre, CEO and founder of Texas Info Group. Um, we help municipalities uh, with consulting, engineering support to deal mainly with uh, planning out asset management plans and incorporating how we can do the asset management plans along with uh, SSO reductions so that we can reduce their uh, their exposures to sanitary sewer overflows um, and help them navigate the uh, the EPA uh, SSO consent decrees and things of that nature. So we do a combination of uh, stopping leaks, um, increasing volume, and just making sure that we can keep the sewage inside the sewer system and not let it escape into the, uh, the living environment. So uh 20 20 plus years of engineering design construction construction management and uh rehabilitation of sanitary sewer systems uh taking all that and just kind of crunching it into consulting services to uh help any of these cities uh municipalities get get back on track for what they what they need to be doing so uh, that's that's what we do at texas Info group love it eric thank you for joining us cassie you're up next um, hi, I'm Cassie Clancy with Pipe Reline Solutions. I'm the owner and CEO of the company. Um, we are basically a consulting and distribution company throughout the Pacific Northwest, through the Rocky Mountains, all the way to Colorado. Um, we really just come in. We work with municipalities, public works departments, um, engineering firms, DOTs. We inspect culverts, stormwater culverts, um, sewer systems. We've got inspection tools for sewer systems. And then we come in and provide solutions. So we really kind of can look at it as a non-bias um, since we don't work directly for a manufacturer we represent a lot of different manufacturers so we can really just kind of come in and give you guys um, give them ideas on how they can repair it love it one-stop shop solution for everything that's, the way <laughs> yeah. to do it. that's what we're trying for yes <laughs> good stuff good stuff well thank you for joining me everybody the guests for joining me as well and everybody like i said online uh, on LinkedIn, make a comment. If there's anything you want to discuss, just pop it in there in the chat and uh, hopefully we'll get some time to address it. But our main conversation today is the repercussions of low bid and how it impacts the life cycle of our infrastructure. And I think this is a, a hot topic for everybody because low bid is, uh, you know, what a lot of the public works, uh, public you know, sector the, they, they use as a way to execute procurement, right? The lowest bid usually wins, unless you have some magical uh, product or service that you come up with, they, they're gonna go with the lowest bidder. But nine times out of 10, or I shouldn't say nine times out of 10, but generally you, when you go with a low bid, you generally get what you paid for, right? I, I mean, that's the way it goes. Uh, so maybe during this discussion we'll we'll get into where quality matters and workmanship matters versus the low bid price uh so i'll start off with nick uh what is your experience with uh, the low bid process and you know life cycle things like that yeah it's just interesting that um you know we, we've broken it down to the low bid because 
I mean, just things are so complicated, especially in our industry. And there's so few people that can provide the services. Um, there's such a crazy investment to to become, uh, you know, someone who can provide the services to municipalities, you know, uh, inspection work, pipe cleaning. I mean, you know, cleaning trucks, half a million dollars. Uh, and they break it down just to who can get their equipment out there, the, you know, absolute cheapest. Um, so I just think it's just doing the city a disservice. Um, there's low accountability uh, on performance, and it all comes down to price. Uh, it does seem kind of wild. Yeah, you're right on there, um, Nick. I was going to say, in the in the equipment world, it's different because you, you have certain specs for a certain type of truck you like or a certain type of uh, camera that you like, right? Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on that as far as the well, – because a lot of people go to Soul Source. They're like, okay, well, Soul Source is a nonprofit government agency, you know, or organization, uh, and they shop around these contracts, and everybody wants to piggyback off these contracts. Well, how is that fair? It's not really competitive bidding. That's just getting a price, and whether it's low or not, you don't really know. You're just getting that contract. Well, uh, any insight into to those kind of things for equipment? Yeah, the specifications can be interesting. Uh, sometimes they're, sometimes you get good specs. We talked about this kind of in another episode. Uh, sometimes you get good specs where they're, they hit the high points. They're general. They let everybody, you know, get in there and uh, and put their best foot forward. And then sometimes you get specs where, you know, things are very specific. Things are written to certain manufacturers, um, which is it's it's it can be good or bad, right? Depends on what side of that you're on. Um, so it just, it seems, um, you know, maybe people have already made up their mind generally before they, uh, before they even put the specs out. So how do they, at that point, how do they know that they're even getting a fair price? Um, yeah. you know, when they, when they've already kind of written the specs to, to limit the bidders. Yeah, that's a good point. That's probably a, another conversation for another day on that right. one, but Susan, go ahead. What is your thoughts on this topic? Well, one of the things that I don't think people consider enough is what is the total life cycle cost of that piece of equipment? If you're going strictly for low bid, let's just say one item costs you 50000 but another costs you 70000 But at the end of the five-year cycle, the consumable parts or the maintenance on it costs you another 50000 where that more expensive piece of equipment, maybe the parts be just because of the way it's built, will only cost you 10,000. So at the end of the road, how much has it really cost you? So it becomes a question of pay me now or pay me later. And I think that that needs to be weighed in, that those questions need to be asked, how much is this thing gonna cost me to keep it up and running for the next five years? Yeah. Or even, you know, when we're talking about rehabilitation, um, one of the things that I came across when I was doing work for manhole, rehabil manhole rehabilitation companies is you go with the low bid. Well, you're going to have to come back and redo that thing in 10 years. Or you can just do it once and it's going to be OK for 40 years. So how much is it going to cost you to keep coming back every 10 years with going out to bid and yada, yada, yada? What goes along with that? thinking about what the long range costs are rather than just that short term price tag now. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great example. Um, it, that's one of those things that you just don't think about, right? It's the location. I've, I've had people come back and say, well, we want to buy a piece of equipment. But our, our first use case uh, at the tournament was uh, buying Ford pickup trucks. Then they wanted to buy it within 25 miles of the city from a dealership, a local dealership. They didn't want the state contract because they would have had to drive downstate typically to a dealership that lowballed the contract for that piece of equipment. And it would be a five hour drive just to take their equipment back and forth and have it serviced, maintained, you know, uh, under warranty or whatever. And they were like, look, we'd just rather bid it locally and get it done that way versus the state contract, which could have been a lower price. But if you think about all the costs associated with you, like you just described, Susan, there's a lot more on top of that. You just add up the time, the money, you know, everything uh, as far as equipment, you know, labor wise up and down, driving back and forth. Uh, Cassie, you're up next on this topic. Um, so it kind of goes back to what Nick said when I, I we kind of start at the beginning with the engineers because of 
the specifications. So what I, what we really try and do is what's, what are they looking for, for longevity of a pipe rehabilitation? Um, what's the, what's the design life that they're looking for? What, what has happened to us and what we obviously discourage is an engineer specifies a specific or a few specific products for a design life. And a contractor will come in with an extremely low bid, win the bid over the people who were actually quoting it with the specified product and try and go back to the engineer and argue a case for an inferior product um, that might only have a 30 year design life compared to the hundred year design life that they had specified. So that's really when, you know, I'll make a call back to the engineer and say, you're going to stick with your spec, right? And, and that contractor has to be held to that specification. You cannot be coming in with a bid, assuming an inferior product is going to be allowed. You really need to bid with what is specified, or even if it's multiple products, you need to get pricing on all of those so that you actually meet that specification. And don't assume an engineer is going to change their mind. That's a, that's a really good point because... <laughs> There's always an alternative or alternate right. Right, uh, that gets thrown in there, hail married right before the you know the time ends, just before you can submit any uh, any changes to the spec, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you have to fight that, like you have to, like if, if it's a, a thing that is put together to make a great pro uh, project, get the new line pipe in there or new manhole structure put in place. And someone just comes in and says, "Hey, well, ours is a great product. Look, we got it's been used everywhere, and and nobody does the background check on the product. First of all, that's yeah. the other issue. It's like, well, did you do any due diligence? Did you look at the lab testing results? Did you look at the material itself? Where's it been used? Well, it's been used over in Australia or wherever. You know, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I just it it doesn't make sense if we're not following up on it and doing the research and that we should be on these products to, to make sure they are, yeah." Equal to what we're putting in the specs. And it can it can be costly with relationships. I I mean, even in in my position where I do go back and I, I follow up with an engineer and say, you know, we I worked with you on this design or this specification on these three products and this contractor saying he's not going to order one of those. He's going to try and get you to bring in something else. And I've now I've now jeopardized a relationship with that contractor, but I'm also saying that was your decision to try and bid low and then think that the engineer was going to change his mind. So now you're, you're feeder to the fire and you're going to have to buy the more expensive product because that's what they specified. Yeah. Um, so that's, Good I mean, point. that's the risk you take, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> as a contractor. Exactly right. But here's the thing Yeah, uh, is once it's installed, who's following up on it? Nobody is. That's right. the, thing, the mindset, right? It's like, we fixed it. It'll be 50 years. No one really, does anything with it after that, you know, five, 10 years down the road. And, hey, did you look at the manhole? Did you look at that pipe and check it? Oh, oh no, it, we haven't gotten to it yet. We got other bigger fish to fry or whatever. So uh, uh, it, it's just one of those things that we deal with. Eric, you're up next, man. Yeah, I've I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly with, with all these different bidding practices. And I've seen people actually switch them up. Um, a lot of times they'll just put out a specification, but it's not a performance spec. It's uh, this is the product or products that they want instead of actually just having performance and saying, hey, we need it to do this. We need it to last X amount of time. And, you know, if they have trackability and traceability with the systems that they're specking out, they would know the, the success of the life cycle of those particular systems. Um, we're not doing a very good job of having a centralized database to be able to track a lot of these things um, collectively. So it's really hard to have traceability to say, you know, on paper, they say that these products have a 50 year design life, but in reality, I've seen a lot of these systems fail and there becomes a lot of finger pointing of poor installation, QA, QC, uh, or just bad product. And so, um, you know, it's uh it can get very complicated especially when you have new engineers coming into the game and you have people that are leaving that kind of know what's worked and what didn't work but when you have new people coming in and they don't and you don't have a centralized database to really collect how long did these systems actually truly last it's it's kind of hard for it puts them in a bad position because they don't have proper data to pull from to say it's going to last this long now 
most projects in the United States of America, you only get a one year bonded warranty, a one year bonded warranty. Now on paper, they'll say this, here's a warranty on paper, but it's 30 pages deep. So if you don't follow up on one of those 30 pages in the next 12 months, then the warranty goes like basically null and void because it's not a, a bonded warranty. A bonded warranty has teeth to it. And if the contractor goes out of the business, if the manufacturer goes out of business, the bonding company still has to pay for any type of uh, failure. And that's a true warranty that actually has teeth to it. It's, it's basically insurance. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that I think they can improve on in Texas. There's a city north of Houston called the city of Conroe and they do what's called a best value contract and they get a scorecard of how well they've done research on that particular installer on that particular system. And, and then they'll score that. What kind of history do they have with the city of Conroe? So they have a bunch of uh, scorecard boxes to where ultimately they come up with the best value that isn't just the lowest bid. So um, I think that's a, that's a pretty smart way to approach some of these projects. That's a good point, uh, Eric. Uh, when you say best value, though, I mean, you're looking at uh, the public works with the amount of labor they have shortage right now. Who's who's doing that? Who's validating uh, and, and qualifying these products uh, or services, right? And, and making sure they're, they are the best value because who has time? Yeah, I, I've had this conversation with the people that write the standards and specifications in Texas, which is it's TCQ. So I said, how come y'all don't do like a third party independent evaluation and, and then have some kind of centralized database to say, here are systems that meet our design criteria and specifications. And that way, you know, the engineers have a resource to go to that they um, they can pull from and say, hey, here's all these systems that have gone through some third party state level testing and they meet or exceed these types of criteria instead of uh, being very, I guess, subjective or, you know, anywhere you go in the state of Texas, you can go from one city to another and they have all kinds of different preferred products. It's I don't know. It's whoever goes and does an amazing sales job to that particular client in that area. It's not always, it's not always end up being the best product based on performance and merits like that. So um, I told the state of Texas, I really feel at some level, if there's some third party independent testing and you can say, Hey, these products do this and there's a potential lifespan based on collected data that we've collected over the years from multiple engineers and owners, um, they'd have a resource to be able to pull that type of data from to say, you know, here's the actual life cycle costs of these various systems. So right now that there's just a, a huge lack of data to be able to make those determinations uh, to, to show true performance, really. Yeah, that's good points. I and I have a lot of stories in regards to this because when we were doing competitive bidding and uh, doing manhole rehab, <laughs> we had one contractor literally would just low bid us every time. And then they, they wouldn't even finish the jobs. Like they wouldn't even get it. They'd win the bid, get in the job, uh, not complete it on time. And the workmanship later, as we found, was it didn't exist. Like they just went in, sprayed some epoxy or whatever they had material wise didn't prep it correctly. The material started falling off the wall within the first year and a half, two years. It's almost like they strategically planned it out to get past that one year warranty that we were all just talking about. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, we just lost all that money, you know, $200 a vertical foot, whatever it was. Now the city has to go back, rip all that out, clean it out, reapply a new material, and then spend another 250, 300 bucks a vertical foot, whatever it's going to cost. Uh, it's, it's amazing what the low bid can can get you if you don't do your due diligence on these companies um anybody else have any other stories to add to that that their experiences i mean in the inspection side of things i mean you it's so common to to find that whoever won the low bid just skipped you know anything that was difficult uh off-road type situations 
you know, easements and backyards. If, you, if it wasn't in the street, you know, it got pushed to the back of the line and then, oh, we didn't get to it. You know, the contract, uh, you know, duration's over and the city is left stuck not not having um, the tougher uh, pipes inspected, which, I mean, generally, you know, that's where you're going to got to clean and maintain those just like the rest of them. Um, so it's really, you know, ends up being a, a disservice to the city and, and uh, yeah, it's just a shame, really. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I heard of one. I, I can't name names where <laughs> uh, it was a big contract. They realized they got in over their head, did not bid enough. And so they basically did about 30% of the video inspection and the cleaning and then what they did was they just duped the video mm. and added it to the report for the rest of the lines. Wow. And so here you're not getting an accurate report. You're just seeing the same, you know, a lot of the sewer line. They felt, well, it kind of looks the same. Nobody's really going to know. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's gonna, it's close enough. I did 30. So they just kind of mixed it up and, and uh, you know, mashed it together to try to just get away with it <laughs> that's uh, there, there's probably so many stories that are uh, like that I've, I've heard the same thing it's like the, the contractor went there they did the small pipes not the big pipes and they just walked out left the 18 engine over just like hey you know we're good and then they'd go back and rebid and and win again like a couple like a year or two later i'm like that's the same contractor just walked out on you two years ago why did you just give them another yeah. draw? Yeah, well, we put zero dollars on that pipe size line item, so we'd ha get the low bid. So we had to skip those. <laughs> right, right. It's it's it's. Uh, I've heard another story of uh, seventy-five dollar vertical foot, uh, big city contract. Right. It's you know everybody wants these big city contracts, which are the sometimes the worst ones to bid on or get. Uh, low bought it, seventy-five bucks a vertical foot. They'd come in. This is just hearsay. Heard the story. Spray the manhole walk off every 15 minutes they're knocking out manholes in 15 minutes and uh nobody's checking them and they're just it's a big contract there's no due diligence there's no follow-up behind them and uh, they're walking out with uh, a lot of money in their pocket and no quality workmanship and you know gotta pay for someone's got to pay the taxpayers are going to pay like yeah. who's responsible for this you know let's think about that like who takes the brunt of it? Is the contractor? Is the engineer? Is the city? Like, who who takes the the blunt of what happened? What is anybody getting held accountable? I guess would be the question. Well, is, Chad, wouldn't you feel like that's something that would be on the city? I mean, that's when they put out a bid. There needs to be some sort of accountability. To your point, where if I'm putting a bid out, I I need to have a very defined inspection process for follow-up whether it's one year whether it's five years whether it's immediately after depending on if you're using a spray concrete liner and you need a two inch wall thickness what was that does somebody go out and measure that and you're not going to leave that up to the contractor that shouldn't be their job that should be somebody else's job whether whether it's the engineer or you have a third party inspection company come in but i feel like that needs to be that again goes back to the accountability of what's specified in the bid that needs to be up cap yeah. basically yeah and, and if you think about it though let's say the engineer put out this project and they're you know nothing against the engineer again we're talking about labor time people right being at the right place and, and and making sure we're holding people accountable but there's times where the engineer might be friends with the contractor what what do you do then yeah and then you have the contractor out on the job site. If they may, you know, sometimes they might make it out. Sometimes they don't. I've, I've seen that happen. And uh, no one's taking samples, grab samples, nothing like that. It's like, oh, no, 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 you guys are good. You know, kind of pass the, the buck, so to speak, uh, on doing certain things that we should be doing on these projects uh, to make sure that quality workmanship's there. Eric, you have any, uh, I know you like this kind of topics, buddy. What, what do you think? Yeah, one of the biggest things that I I see missing a lot of times is 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 qualified third party inspections. So um, some of these engineering firms, if they can work to have third party inspectors or consulting firms assist them in the QA QC part, 
and that firm or the people that work at that firm as far as qualifications have actually done these installations and they're qualified to do QA, QC, it would be a huge value to the owner, the engineer and everybody across the board to have a lot better QA, QC. So I'll see like traditional inspectors on site, but trenchless technology, coatings, rehab, um, sewer environments. Um, I'm certified in taking a lot of training from, uh, from NACE, SSPC, um, ACI, and these are all the people that do concretes, epoxy coatings, and all these all these things. So NASCO is trying to put together some standards with uh, with NACE, and NACE is now it's not NACE anymore. It's uh, it's called AMP. It's like AMP or AMPP or something like that. But uh, they're trying to put together municipal coating specifications because honestly, NACE. NACE specs that they've used for years, they don't cut the mustard because NACE standards and specifications for coatings are mainly for uh, for metals and oil and gas. They're not designed for uh, a moisture, wet, concrete, saturated underground environment. So you have a lot of failures on a lot of coating systems, uh, epoxies, urethanes, ureas, uh, due to a lot of not so much surface prep, but the fact that a lot of these materials are highly reactive to a damp or, or water moisture saturated uh, environment. And if you can't control that environment to get those elements out of there, then your lining systems aren't going to adhere. They're not going to stick. And you're going to have a lot of epic failures like we've had. I mean, epoxy coatings in the first uh, 10, 15 years in the municipal wastewater sector have been some of the biggest failures because of lack of, of knowledge and QA, QC to be able to tell somebody when they need to, you know, stop spraying or shut down because they can't get the environmental conditions correct to match what's required for the, uh, the product to be successful. And so um, they'll stick for about a year or two, but then, you know, after that, you see stuff start kind of like flaking off. You got pinholes and a lot of other issues with those, those liners that, uh, um, you know, it's very problematic and it's more expensive. It's more expensive to have to grind and rip all that stuff off and reapply it than it actually is to install it initially. So, um, it's, it's a big problem and they're going to need, I think a third party QA, QC with trenches, technology and coatings is really what you need to see more of because the, the third party is going to work in conjunction with the spec and the engineer but he's going to report directly to the owner and then all his findings and observations. He'll share that with the, uh, the engineer that's kind of in charge of the project and the contract documents. So I think you need, I think you need more third party qualified, certified QA, QC people uh, working directly with the, uh, with the engineering firm. Yeah. That's a good point, Eric, all around. It, it, it'd be interesting to see what that could look like down the road. If, we could include in our projects a third party vetting process or QA, QC, like you say, uh, to help us validate that these liners are being put in correctly, that they're being prepped correctly. That's the biggest part uh, of what I understand is the preparation. Like if that's not prepped correctly, every or any material will likely fail. I mean, and Cassie can probably explain this a little bit more than I can, but you know, if you don't do the right wetting out of like liners, things like that. You create voids, you create space, you create, and we, we did this in, in roots. I, I've seen cities pull, ripping out uh, liners. This was back in like 2010, 2011, uh, liners that were put in back in the early 2000s because they just weren't applied correctly, I guess. And then the roots started pushing out at the lateral connection, the newly lined pipe. Well, what would have been the line, new line pipe uh, st started pushing and bulging it out into the sewer main and it was blocking it up because there was no structure there to, to keep the roots at bay, so to speak. Um, did anybody else want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Let's say the information is out there. I mean, NASCO has two different uh, inspector certification programs. Um, I'm yeah. curious as to how widely those are used and how often they're required in, in projects. I mean, I don't, I don't look at a lot of service you know contract specifications anymore but 
Um, I know that NASCO has had that program for quite some time um, for manhole rehab and CIPP liner. Yeah. Cassie, do you want to say anything to that? Yeah, I, I mean, it goes back to uh, the de the design really, and the and what the what basically design life and structure. If you're trying to restructure um, a pipe, and this goes, this is more in stormwater than sewer. But if you're trying to make it a structural fix, you can't just go in there and slip line it and leave it. You have to grout around the slip lining pipe, and that goes for everything. So whether you're going in with CIPP. And there's a lot of CIPP specifications on, on pipes, but if you haven't actually grouted outside the CIPP, then you haven't actually fixed the soil that has a problem that's infiltrating. So when you see potholes in roads, that's an issue with the well, that's an issue with the culvert below it, which means it needs a structural fix. So almost everything we represent has a structural integrity to it so that you can basically you're mm -hmm. getting it back that 50 to 100 year design life. Yeah, that's a that's a great point right there uh structural stability of you know the soil around the structure itself uh if we're not fixing that what's the point and 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 to kind of add on to that is like if we're lining pipe which this never made sense to me right we're lining pipe but we don't seal up the lateral or grout the lateral and we keep that void space right there so we reinstate it cut the cut the lateral open and you know it, it's good you, i get it you, you got a new new main right you got a new line pipe but we don't think about the angular space behind that pipe after it cures right all the i and i that gets behind it right and then at the lateral connection you got all the roots starting to push back down into the sewer main uh eventually blocking it up and uh you know we aren't taking the additional steps because that's considered private the connection right in some situations some cities take care of it some cities don't uh but ultimately if you're trying to use lining like for manholes or, or sewer pipe to increase life cycle right you also got to be thinking about is it going to prevent or stop our problem which is i and i roots whatever it might be if you're not thinking about that in in your spec right when you're building it to fix the laterals and things then what are we doing because you're still going to have access for all the i and i to keep coming back in whether you lined all your pipe or not if you don't fix that jump that uh, y or whatever you want to call it the i is just going to pour right back into that pipe and you're going to wonder why we still have an i and i problem for example so um any other conversations you want to have on on that and you know i think you just you're just pushing the problem like if you if you block off one area then you're going to consolidate that to another point of penetration so you have to be real careful that you get that whole pipe done from point A to point B, it's done holistically where you've got that whole pipe completely sealed up. Because if you if you seal up a big portion, but then you leave a small, tiny portion, that water's going to find a way back to that path of least resistance and going to find a way to enter back into the pipe. And, you know, you're going to still have problems. So you really need to really need to fix from point A to point B and then move to the next section and the next section and, and get it done complete, completely done instead of just little tiny increments, I guess. Yeah, good points, Cassie. Yeah, no, I, I think you you hit it nail on the head. I and I is one of the biggest things, and I feel like that's becoming more of the education piece. Um, like when I go meet with engineers, the I think one of the most timid thing is is the grouting aspect of slip lining. Um, but if you're not fixing that, if you're not grouting, and it doesn't matter, like I said, it doesn't matter what what you're using, but if you don't fix it around, then you really haven't you haven't done yourself justice. So that's yeah. an educational piece and that's you know every contractor thinks oh grouting is so easy that's the that's actually the only part you can really screw up so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well and a lot of a lot of places aren't even inspecting the laterals yet i mean there's you know we, we talk to municipalities all the time that you know a few are interested in in like the lateral launch option on a cctv van but not many because mm -hmm. um, they're really still you know like we've talked about so many times, you know, limited resources, right? So they're still focused on main lines, cleaning and inspecting main lines. But, you know, how much of the problem is coming from laterals? We they don't even know. It's not even on their radar yet. They they might not want to know. <laughs> That's a good point, Eric. Uh, they might not want to know. 
there, there, there are a lot of clients that I've, I've, I've dealt with that, you know, they, they, they know how bad it is on certain segments and they're like, we don't even have a good handle on that yet. So why do we, why do we want to further make it look bad? I said, but the bottom line is you really need to get as much data on that segmented line so that you can fix it. You really need to fix as much as you can in one place and then move on to the next and quit trying to do like little patches and band-aids, like get it completely where you need it to be, you know, as much as you can and then move on to the next segment. So that you've got, you know, complete, you know, lockout of I and I and points of penetration. Otherwise you're just, you're just going to keep cycling around and chasing your tail. Yeah. So you, you bring up a good point, Eric, but we don't have the money. You're, like, you're talking about all these things. This is the objection you're going to get. Uh, we got the money to do that. So we're just going to do what we can with what we have. Right. That's it. That's it. Uh, that's the common objection that we all deal with typically in those conversations. But I, go ahead, Eric, were you going to say something? Yeah. I'm just going to say like you, 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 they say that they don't have money, but I run across to a point where you get a massive sinkhole and something collapses or this or that, and then it becomes an emergency repair. And then when you have an emergency repair and it costs you 10 times what it would have been up front to do it right, where are you getting these emergency funds to uh, spend the money on that. Yeah, good point. Really good point. Nick, did you have something to add to that? Well, I was going to say it's kind of, a, it's, you know, it's kind of exponentially increases you inspect more. So if we do inspect the laterals, it's not just the cost of, of inspecting the laterals. Then you've increased the rehabilitation cost because now you know about so many more problems. Um, that's so good. that's, you know, I think that's scary for a lot of municipalities. That's a, that's a great time. I used to hear this all the time in sales. It's like, we don't want to look at our system because we're going to find problems. <laughs> yeah, like, find too many problems. <laughs> you just want to wait for it to collapse? And they're like, yes, yeah, I don't, I don't want to know. If I don't know, then I don't have to think about it, right? I don't have to you know, worry about it at nighttime. I, I, you know, that's the thought process. But you know, there's different funding when it becomes an emergency situation, when it's procurement, right? It's, it's now you can dip into other funds that... Uh, that uh, you can rely on to to solve these problems if they occur, right? Um, where do you think we could maybe solve this if it is possible? Is it the specification, like the way we write specs? Is it the way we, you know, put it all together, or is it just uh, just lack of money in general? I, I I don't know if it's both. I, I would imagine it's both, but. Where do we go as far as solving the problem? Because I've seen specs really poorly written. I've seen them really redundant and made no, no sense whatsoever. And if you're not a part of the, the building of that spec and involved in it, and you're like the, the, the next contractor down the line to see the spec once it's published, you're at a huge disadvantage, right? To, to potentially bid on it. Um, so, so where do you think we can maybe improve some of these things uh, as far as increasing the lifestyle? Obviously, we did QA2C where we'd have maybe a third party uh, kind of vet these these projects. But where else can we do it? You know, I'm just thinking the specs might be one. Any uh, insight from anybody? We're not here for solutions, Chad. We're just here to fix <laughs> problems. <laughs> well, I think we're just negative Nancy all the time, Nick. We're going to have to come up with something at some point in time for solutions. Jeez. Uh, I mean, you know the uh, the the spec, the spec is the uh, is the complete guide of what is going to happen on that project. So the specifications that the engineer puts out for the project, um, that is the set of instructions by which everybody has to follow. Um, everybody has to follow. So it tells you about the QA, the QC. It tells you the performance. It tells you what it, what materials are acceptable. Um, and it tells you, you know, whatever the engineer puts in there, that's what the contractor has to follow as a set of instructions. So if those instructions um, don't cover enough of QA, QC and all these these other, you know, areas, you know, the, the contractor's just going to follow. He's going to follow whatever it says to do in the. Uh, specifications so the specifications for the project it rules and guides the entirety of the project then it's up to the uh the owner and the engineer to make sure that qa qc protocols are followed 
throughout the duration to make sure the quality of the installation is done as best as it can. Yeah. So, do you, do you think it's the job of the engineer to maybe instead of just, you know, finding capital projects to put, you know, to, to help the city with, like you said, Eric, if you're kind of just piecemealing these little sections of the town or whatever the pipes in different parts of the town together. And maybe that's the, the thing you have to do, because if you think about it, uh, not all the pipes are the same, right? It's just every segment of pipes different and they all have maybe more risk than others. So in order for you to to have a good proactive approach to rehabilitation, it would be to find those spots within your community to fix those. You know, you just can't do it all in one place as we all would love. We all don't have that big bucket of money sitting there, right? But is right. it the engineer's uh, job to make sure that the cities are doing everything, like sealing the laterals and the main, if they're doing everything at one time? Is that the engineer's job? The, the engineers are only going to do what the client instructs them to do. Interesting. So, so I've been on a Harris County uh, utility board of directors and, you know, the board of directors is basically the same thing as a miniature city council. So uh, the city council, the, the leaders of that municipality, they have directives and they send those directives out to their consultants and their engineers to, you know, get the work done. And they take the vision of what they say and the directions that they have of each community from each municipality leader. And they say, Hey, here's how much money we have and here's the problems that we have. What's, what's the best solution for that. And that's, that's what the engineers try to try to provide for the client. Yeah. That's a good point. I was just um, curious on who, who should be making those recommendations and uh, you know, the engineer seems like that person would be the, the, the person that's kind of guiding that city in that direction. Cause they're always going to an engineer to ask like, Hey, what if we do in this situation, that situation, and vice versa. Um, go ahead, Cassie. Have you guys noticed a lot, at least in my area, so I was wondering if in the other areas that you guys are in, a lot of um, municipalities are hiring in-house engineers so that they can really control the outcome. And even if they do bring in an outside engineering firm as a third party, they have the internal engineer who's a basically the checks and balances of that mm -hmm. to say, hey, if we're going to fix this, why don't we fix this at the same time? Because that I work for the city and that's going to save the city money. I've, I've heard that, Cassie. That's a great point. I've heard that here in, in the Midwest as far as bringing on their own engineers instead of outsourcing uh, some of the work. And I, and I kind of wonder why that is, but I guess that, that makes sense. It's kind of uh, maybe QA, QC is the engineering firm that you're hiring on these projects to make sure they're doing their job and making sure the contractors are doing theirs and so on and so forth. That's a good point. Um, any other comments on this, Susan? Did you want to add anything? Or? Yeah, actually, just because of over the last year or so, in interviewing a number of cities, what I've been hearing is um, a willingness for the cities, you know, they don't like to talk about it, but just circling back on the I&I &I issue, that they're feeling or they're, they're sensing that at least 70% of the I&I &I is not coming from the main lines, but it's coming from the residential laterals. And so finding a way to work with residents in taking over or getting a temporary, what is that called, eminent domain, hmm. and actually taking on the relining or the rehabilitation of those laterals that they know that the source of the I, &I is coming into that, into the main line, as they're lining the main line, take care of the laterals at the same time, they take on the expense and it seems like, oh, wow, well, that's not really our responsibility. But they, some of these cities have actually done some calculations that them taking on the expense, mm. they'll pay that back to themselves in mm. what they'll save in eliminating the excess I&I &I that's coming in at the treatment level. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it may take a year or two for them to pay themselves back but it's a worthwhile investment in taking on that expense for a little bit because it's going to save money in the long run. Because like what Eric is saying that, you know, you're sealing up these big areas. You may seal up the land, the, the manhole, but water is always going to find a way in if it can. Mm -hmm. 
And it's just something that I think, you know, there have been some cities, uh, there was one in Ohio that has had great success with this, that's eliminated in certain sections, just taking this over almost, you know, like 98% of the I and I in this problem area that it's really a, a case for other cities to really be considering this. Yeah. To, to, to extend to what Susan's saying, one of the key phrases that cities and engineers don't put enough value in and they don't do the math on the most is the word ROI. There you go. ROI. I said, you know, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs know what the word ROI means. Uh, a lot of successful businesses know what the word ROI means, but cities and engineers need to start incorporating ROI to say, what is this asset leaks costing me? If this asset leak is costing me X amount and I, I pay to seal it up on this date, how many months or years is it going to take me to recoup that investment? Because anything that enters into the sewer system that's not sewer, that's costing you thousands of millions and over time billions of dollars, to be honest with you, because once it's overcapacitated, it's not just the cost of the treatment. It's now the, the state level and federal um, EPA uh, SSO uh, fines and fees that you have to tack on top of that. So when you when you put those numbers together and I have a I have an Excel spreadsheet actually produces that that number. And then when you extrapolate how many rain events you get a year and then you put in uh, numbers from your treatment plant and all this stuff combined and what it's costing you. You got to figure out what I and I is costing you, and then what's the hot spots in the system that you can start in the hot spots to start eliminating uh, by figures of what it's costing you um, as a hot spot because that's going to give you your fastest return on investment. So it's going to free up more funding to do to do more. Yeah, it's good stuff, Eric. It's all about money. Everything's about money. It is. It? You can't do anything if you don't have it. <laughs> so. No, it, it, it is. And so engineers and municipalities, they need to drill into their head that 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 acronym, ROI, return on investment. Yeah, I think that's uh, the way we need to start looking at utilities is that exactly for you know, we're billing for sewer. We're billing for water. You know, uh, what are we doing with that? The funds, first of all, where is the funds going? Uh, is it being put back into the infrastructure or are we just going to keep upgrading wastewater treatment plants, you know, to try and catch all the I and I and, and hopefully that's a quick band aid, but that's not solving the collection system problem, which is a big, uh, it's the elephant in the room, so to speak. Uh, you can upgrade your plant all day, but that collection system is getting older and it's still leaking and it's still got roots, still got debris, it's still got problems. And uh, uh, looking at a different way of addressing these things, um, looking at the comments, that's an interesting, um, you know, just part of like accepting pipe products that are made outside of USA. Uh, so this is an interesting point as far as we're talking about life cycle. You know, outside, do we have any regulation when we're bringing products in from foreign countries into the United States as far as quality checks and things like that? Is it set to a certain standards like we have in the United States? Do you guys know anything more about that? Um. I serve on the uh, NASCO like government um, committee or whatnot, and we have some big discussions over the next two years with the infrastructure bill. There's going to be a big push for Made in America uh, products um, for all the projects coming out. They want more jobs. They want manufacturing, and they they want all that coming back to the United States because we have a, a rising population. So if you have a rising population, you're going to have to have jobs for all those people. So um, it's no secret at this point that we're trying to get manufacturing back here. And there's going to be a big push in the next 24 months to have a lot of products that are made in America. So yeah, I, I ran into one time and uh, I was uh, talking to one city and the, in his in his office, there was a bolt. Uh, it was just a nice size bolt. It was all corroded and broken. And I go, where, where did you find that? He's like, well, that was from one of my pumps. It was a pump from overseas and this is what happened to it. It broke off and like, didn't have any, it didn't last long. I think it was in there for like two years, he said, and the whole bolt just corroded and broke off. And then his pump got messed up and it was a whole thing. 
but that's a good point. It's like bringing in foreign products. Uh, we have an accountability there uh, when we're putting them into our infrastructure. Anybody have, we have like 10 minutes left. Um, any other conversations you want to have on this life cycle topic? Yeah, the foreign products thing is, is really interesting because it kind of goes both ways. Like uh, sometimes you might be dealing with maybe a per perception of an inferior product. Um, mm -hmm. And then sometimes, it, you know, some products got kind of go the other way. Like, oh, it's, you know, this is a, maybe a, a, a better product than we're currently making over here. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of hard to, to have it both ways, right? Like, are we going to we're going to accept foreign products or not? Um, and if we're only going to do American products, then what, how, you know. That's a slippery slope. Right? Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest pump manufacturers for uh, uh, pump stations and things like that is flight. And a lot of those parts from flight come from Europe. So, I mean, um, you know, German parts, Italian parts. It's funny that by certain countries, we have a perceived notion of the quality level. But the thing is, any company can solicit another manufacturer to make them a good, better or best product. And at the end of the day, based on performance and what a client wants as far as money, they can dictate whether or not they want good, better, best. So whether, you know, I've seen I've seen products in, you know, the biggest gripe from a lot of people is getting cheap, what they call cheap products from China. Well, we become a disposable nation and we like cheap products because when it's done and it's cheap, we can throw it away and just get another one. But with infrastructure, we can't do that because downtime and other issues of bypassing are so costly that you need a high value uh, product. But that those standards, those specifications for the performance base, those are all part of the requirements that are in the specification for the project. So um, whether you get a product from China, China can make the very best product you can you can pay for. And they can also make the cheapest product. But so can every other country. America does the same thing too. There's there's manufacturers in the United States that make a low bottom entry, cheap, cost effective product, and then there's some people that make the highest level product. It's just what the consumer wants to buy. I have, I have, uh, this is a good point because uh, does anybody else have something to add? I, I I'm going to add one more thing to this. It might be a little long, but um, you look at the way we do procurement real quick in the life cycle, right? And, if you look at procurement and it goes to the finance department, the, sometimes the public works guys aren't even involved in that process because that goes to finance in some of these cities where they're actually get the bids, they look at them, they're qualifying, they're doing the uh, the rating like you're talking about, Eric. They're giving it a, the, the score, right? They're, they're checking out. How do they know what's a good product in infrastructure versus the, the you know buying toilet paper? No disrespect there, but that's a big difference in putting stuff in the ground versus buying something that we use every day. You know, just think about that um, as, as who's making these decisions. Sometimes I guess in the procurement might be another topic for us uh, to discuss down the road. Susan, do you have any, anybody else want to chime in? We got like seven, eight minutes left. I think I the only thing I have to ask. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, Cassie. I was just going to say, there's a couple of products I represent that, are, there's no equal or they're just not made in the US. So in that situation, if you want if you want a certain type of product for um, pipe repair, if it's not made in the US, I mean, so I, I, somebody made a comment about the buy American executive order and you have to get the owner has to get a waiver from the federal government. Why would that be needed if it's there is it's not even designed here and it's not made here by anybody? Yeah. I mean, when I when I when I served as a mud board of director, if I knew that a product, we liked it, it was good, it made, you know, it made performance specifications, things like that. And we, we knew that to be a good product. I don't, I don't think you should be able to limit consumers and limit, you know, municipality consumers on what they like, because once they like something and they can, they have access to it, um, it's going to prohibit and it's going to make things exclusive. And when they become more and more exclusive, um, the price typically shoots up through the roof. That's that's actually what happens. It becomes more restrictive. And so when the price goes up because it's more restrictive, that doesn't help the taxpayer and that doesn't help 
with options. I mean, you always, in my opinion, if we're going to be a free capitalistic society and nation, that's predicated on having access to options. So here's a price point and here's the quality of the product. If somebody doesn't like it, they can go, they can go make a better product and offer it in the market at a better price. And if they can do that in America, then great. <laughs> yeah. Good, good points. Um, one thing that Susan kind of mentioned to, to me, I, I think we should have brought up earlier that I didn't uh, talk about buy boards and the nonprofit, you know, organizations that, that they profit off procurement opportunities. They do. I mean, they take a contract, they charge a contractor X amount of percentage. They tell everybody you're getting a great deal. I've looked at the prices and I'm like, okay, well, that that's the same price that we charged everybody, <laughs> you know? So how are, what is, does anybody have an opinion on like these groups that, you know, do these piggyback contracts or contracting uh, and they're profiting off of their nonprofit, but they're profiting off of all of these procurement opportunities of infrastructure products and services. Susan, you want to maybe elaborate a little bit more on that before we get, finish up? Well, I was just curious um, on everybody's thoughts because it was such an important thing to get involved with being on, like, of course, the one in Texas, the HGAC buy, which is now accepted everywhere. And, and now there's another one called CoStars, I believe. That what's your opinion on it as um, contractors, manufacturers, reps? Is it helping procurement? Is it leveling the playing field? Is it kind of kind of circumventing the, the low bid and putting a little more freedom or choice back in the hands of the municipalities to pick the things they really want instead of being forced to take the lowest price? Yeah. Uh, I guess my, my feeling is how, how great has it been and is it a help or a hindrance? I mean, I think they've done a really good job of marketing themselves as being <laughs> helpful. Yeah, no um, I mean, those contracts are for multiple years. So what's anyone going to do? Is anyone going to, that, that's on a, a cooperative contract, are they going to price it as low as possible, not knowing what's happening over the next three to five years, however long that contract is? Or, you know, uh, probably not. But yet that's going to be the price tomorrow and it's going to be the price in three years. So I think it's it's hurting municipalities. They, they think they're getting a good deal. Um, right. They've been sold this perception um, that it's, you know, that it's e that it's easier and better. But I, I don't know that it really is because um, you're at this point, you're asking people to be able to tell the future as to what, you know, what prices are going to do. Um, and if you're not on the contract, but you have a better product, what are you just out of luck? Because, you know, oh, we're only going to use, you know, whatever cooperative purchasing thing that we can. Um, so I think they're kind of, it's kind of self-sabotaging. In that respect the, the the cooperatives the cooperatives are just another it's just another option and so the owner has to evaluate whether if they have a quote unquote low bid option put it out for bid or at the price that they can see on a cooperative can they go get what they want and do they already like what's available and then that's an option to the owner to where they can literally just go get that at that particular price and and jump on and go get it done quickly. Um, some, in some cases it's great. And in some cases it's not great, but that's really, that really comes down to what the owner wants to do. Yeah. I think it's just ease of use, right? It's there. It's easy, simple. Got a contract there. Yeah. Like, if it works, yeah, if, if it I works, work, if I, if I was there. it's like, it's like anything, like it might work for the, these guys over here and it might not work for these guys over here, but at least they, they have the option. They all have these options at their disposal to use all these different options to procure service or products. Yeah. Good, good conversation guys. This has been awesome. I mean, Cassie, there was a question in there for you. I don't know if you want to address it uh, before we end here. Uh, the example that I was using was a, um, a flexible fabric reinforced pipe. Nice. I'm not aware of any manufactured in the U S so. Got it. And Mike Williams, we see your comment there. Water tables are driving many cities have declared emergencies. Do the job well. Sorry, I'm reading out loud. <laughs> so, and then uh, manpower. Yeah, those are things uh, we could definitely talk about. Um, maybe next time we're going to come up with some more topics. Uh, this has been great, though. I mean, we're talking about things that really need to be talked about because nobody's 
nobody's really doing that. I mean, we're not bringing these things to to light. And I think there's this misconception that um, everything's hunky dory and everyone's doing fine in the sewer space, maybe. And and it's it's not that way. It's it's a it's a it's it's a lot of grind. It's a lot of work. It's it's you know there's a lot of issues there uh, that we should be talking about. Eric, what are you laughing about, man? Um. Well, the the thing is with with trenchless technology, there's not it's not a traditional school route that you would go for civil engineering doing dirt work and concrete and and metal. Uh, the trenchless technology that we have, that's the future of us rehabilitating the entire water, wastewater, underground buried infrastructure in the United States. And so people like us in this particular room uh, with experience, certifications and stuff like that, uh, we could be huge assets to owners and engineers um, through third party consulting and saying, hey, we would like you guys to possibly do a review, like a 90 percent review because of y'all's credentials and your experience. Um, to pay for somebody to do that review to say, hey, Eric, you used to be a contractor for Manhole Rehab for 15 years. Why don't you look over this contract and give us your thoughts on any potential issues, change orders, or areas where we can enhance this project to make sure that we get the best value for this so that we can incorporate that into the specification before we put it out for final bid. If, if you were to pay somebody to do those types of reviews with the kind of expertise that we have on this panel from, from all of us, I guarantee you, you would, you would enhance these projects tremendously. And if you amplified that by people of our experience and caliber with trenches technology that worked with the owners and worked with the engineers, you would see the value of these contracts, um, in my opinion, exponentially get a lot better. Well, it's, thanks so much, Eric, for, for giving us, and, and thank you for consulting services that you just put out there that you want to start doing. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> is, uh, anyway, guys, we're out of time. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me, the guests, the you know guests online and LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Looking forward to uh, February when we uh, have another infrastructure roundtable number four, actually. This, is, this has been great. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Chad. Thanks.